So in this video, I'm going to go over the next evaluation method, which is internal rate of return, or IRR. The three concepts I'm going to talk about in this video have to do with how do you calculate it, what are the different calculation methods to get internal rate of return, um, and, and a little bit like what it means too. And then what do you do, the concept that actually with internal rate of return there might be multiple rates, so how do you manage that? And then um, also when you're comparing alternatives, choosing between several mutually exclusive alternatives, um, you need to use um, you need to use incremental analysis when you're comparing alternatives. So first of all, um, internal rate of return is where you actually calculate an interest rate such that the net present value is zero. So you're given a cash flow um, like the one shown here, and the question is what interest rate or return are you getting? So you set up the net present value equation, set it equal to zero, and solve for i. And that's called internal rate of return, or i star. Um, this is used quite a bit because it is sort of a good way of comparing between alternatives. We all know how much interest we're paying on a loan. We know how much we might get in a savings account. So the concept of interest rate has some relevance for us. Um, so if I star is greater than the required return, so when we calculate the I star, if it's greater than the required return, then we accept the project. And we're not, we can't compare, like, is this interest rate larger than this interest rate? We can only look at if it's greater than the required return. Um, when you're comparing between projects, choosing between projects, you must use incremental analysis. And we'll go, I'll go through that in a minute. So a simple example is we have a thousand dollar invested and then 12 years later we get three thousand dollars back. So what we do is we set up a net present value equation where we have minus thousand plus three thousand p given f i for 12 years. So you see I'm setting this equal to zero and i now is the unknown value. Um, so I set up an equation and I'm going to use the actual equation here so that I can actually solve for i and I get i is equal to 9.6%. Now, it's almost never possible to solve for i, because usually it's a very complex problem. So on this side, um, it shows the relationship between the x-axis, with it, which is interest rate, and the y-axis, which is the present value, the net present value. So for this particular investment that's up in the, up in the corner there. Um, so what I did is I graphed for each interest rate what is the net present value. So you can see at an interest rate of zero, the net present value is 200, which is just the sum of all of the cash flows, right? A negative 1,000 plus a positive 1,200 is 200. And then as we discount more, the net present value gets less and less until there's a point where it crosses, um, it crosses the, the x-axis. And that's the point that uh, that interest rate is such that the net present value is zero. And that's the I star value. So in this case, it's about 9% is the I star value. That's the graphical method of determining what, um, what the interest rate is. You choose different, I mean, the internal rate of return. You choose different interest rates, and you graph that against the net present value, and you find out where it crosses zero. Um, so the, another method is to use some uh, sort of a trial and error method, which is related to the graphical method. What you're trying to do is find the place where it crosses zero, and so you choose different interest rates, and you calculate what is the net present value at different interest rates, and you go up or down in order to try to get close to zero. So I'm going to show you how to do that with this particular investment. So this investment is $1,000 and then $150 a year and then a, a salvage value at the end for 12 years. So I set up a net present value equation where their i is an unknown. This should be this should be a lowercase i. Those I'm going to solve for that and that. They have to be the same value, so we're going to solve for that. And the way we do it is we just choose an interest rate first, and I'm going to try 10%. And I put it, go ahead and look up those factors in the table, and then I see, well, what is the net present value at um, 10%? So it's a positive number. So if you remember from the, the graph on the previous page, if we go back to that, um, I want to, it's right here, I'm getting a positive net present value, so I need to choose a higher discount rate. So I'm going to go ahead and choose 12% discount rate look up those factors, and I can see it's a negative 39.8. So I've sort of bracketed it, positive 56 to negative 39.8 at 10 and 12. And in order to find out what that is, I do an inter, um, uh, linear interpolation on that, and I get an um, interest rate of um, 
of 11.2%. Uh, so that's the answer is 11.2%. That's what the um, internal rate of return is. Um, I can also do, the, for the same equation, I can do it in Excel, which is probably like the easiest way completely to do it. Um, I went ahead and typed in all the cash flows into Excel, and then I highlighted it by getting the function IRR. So then I highlight a range there, and I just hit enter, and it gives me 11.14%. Now, the, the interesting thing is that this is 11.2%, um, and that's because I'm assuming a um, linear line. So going back to the line is it's actually not quite linear. So you can be off a little bit in that in that calculation. You need to be careful. In this case I have 11.2 but when I do it in Excel I have 11.14. So this is a more correct number, the one in Excel. And really in real life when you do this you'll just be doing this in Excel. You probably won't be doing a trial and error. But you won't have access to Excel on the tests so you'll need to under, know how to do it in the, um, in the direct solving or the trial and error method. So now we've done the, um, sort of showed you how various ways of calculating it. Now we'll look at the concept of multiple rates. So it's possible that you have the equations are such that you might have multiple points where it crosses the x-axis, which means you'll have multiple i stars. So we'll look at an example of this. In this case, we have a $1,000 investment, we have $1,900 return, and then we have another $1,000 negative at the end. Um, this is two changes in cash flow. So it goes from negative to positive, and then positive to negative. And the number of potential times that you'll have different roots of this equation are going to be um, two, because it's equal to the number of times you um, switch signs. So it occurs more when you have more than one change in sign. So in this case, you can see the net present value, I mean, the net present value is zero at two interest rates. One at some very small interest rate, like 0.1, 0.05%, half a percent, and then up around 90%. So the question is then, which is the right I star? And obviously, they're actually both very odd numbers. So this is a very odd investment you can see by the cash flows, but there is potential for this. Now there are a lot of people who have looked at how to correct for this and how to look for changes in this. It, I don't think it's that important. The main thing to remember is that this can happen and so you need to be just aware that um, that if there's more than one change in cash flow, you might have multiple I stars. And that's just one reason why internal rate of return is not the best method to use. Um, uh, this also, when we look at the function IRR, which I showed you on the previous slide, we took those values, that range of values, but you can also see there's another thing that's called a guess. And that mean, that recognizes that there might be multiple IRRs and you might want to tell it where to start um, looking for, because it's an iterative process to find the internal rate of return. Um, most people don't do that anymore. It used to be required, but it's not so much required anymore. But that's what the guess is, to, to recognize that there could be multiple I stars. So the next thing we're going to look at is comparing alternatives. So inter internal rate of return, um, I mentioned that it's not uh, the best method to use, and there's a couple reasons. One is because you can have multiple interest rates, um, multiple solutions to the IRR, and then the other is because in comparing alternatives, you need to use incremental analysis. And I'm going to go through sort of some logic associated with that. So let's say we have these multiple options here for investing. And we calculate the net present value of them. And in the net present value rule, what we do is we choose the highest net present value. So in this case, we would choose investing and a vending. So we would go ahead and invest in that because it has the highest net present value. Um, but if we looked at a different method, like calculating internal rate of return, we might actually say we should invest in the Apple stock. But actually, that is not the right investment. The better investment is vest investing in vending. So um, we're gonna, I'm going to go through the logic of why that's true. Let's consider these two investments. We have an initial investment, and we have annual benefits, and we have the short life, just because it's easier to solve these short lives. So if I do the calculation of net present value of the gypsum, it, be, it actually gets is 587. And then I compare that to the net present value of the SAM still, and that's um, 619. So in this case, we would say we are going to choose the SAM still investment. That's the better investment. And then, but then if we calculate the, um, we calculate the internal rate of return, we're going to get uh, the, in the 
investment, the internal rate of return is 14.35 for the gypsum and then 13.07 for the SAM still. So those are opposite, right? So in this one, we would say invest in the SAM still. If we were comparing, if we were looking for the highest internal rate of return, we would say we were going to invest in the gypsum. But that's not correct. We can't do it that way. So what we want to do is we want to say the way we're going to do it is invest in the lowest cost alternative, do an IRR for the lowest cost alternative, and see if that's greater than the 10% required return. It is, so that's a good investment. So then what we do is we say, are we willing to, to invest an additional $5,000? So it's the incremental between the gypsum and the SAM still. Are we willing to invest that? And if we are, we're going to calculate the rate of return on that incremental investment. In this case, it's 10.49%, which is greater than 10%. Therefore, it's a good investment. So it's better to do the SAM still. So that's the same answer as the net present value, but a different answer than this. So we will use this incremental analysis will get us the same answer as using net present value analysis. So what we covered in this video is looking at the calculations, multiple rate of returns, and then comparing alternatives.